You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners. This is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast. And as you know, this is a podcast all about learning how to shed our limiting labels and beliefs so we can live our full, true selves. And today's guest, well, today's guest has a lot to share about that. We're going to have a great conversation, but let me tell you a little bit about her first. Our guest today is Carrie Hart. Carrie Hart, and that's I'm telling you that twice because I don't want you to confuse her with the other Carrie Hart, which is an inside joke we'll find out about. So Carrie has just released a new book called Sojourner in Ottawa, which is an, a mind expanding ideas and practical tools for the open minded seeker of a meaningful life. So that fits right in with the No Labels, No Limits podcast purpose and our mission. But that's just a little bit too short of an intro for her. When, when Carrie first began her spiritual explorations, she would channel messages from a wise and wonder, wonderful entity, Quato. And she was doing that at 4 a.m. every day. Well, at the same time, she was living what I would call like a dual existence in corporate America. So she would do that at 4 a.m. and then hop in her car dressed up for her corporate world and go to work. Um, and she was vice president of information services for a really large corporation. So this was, this was quite the contrast for <laughs> Carrie. So then we fast forward to today where she has spent over 25 years on her spiritual journey as a channeler of Quato and a shaman working with power animals and as a meditation teacher. So, when her deeply beloved husband of 46 years died suddenly, Carrie found that she needed to actually shift a little bit and turn her work on healing and, and growing back on herself because she'd been pouring out to other people for so long. And through that journey, she has created a life for herself, which is joy-filled, which might be seem like a pretty big stretch if you'd had that big long shared life and then it's changed it's just in a different form so with that i want to welcome carrie officially to the no labels no limits podcast hello what a pleasure to be here thank you so much so for the listeners the reason that i said the the real carrie hart <laughs> as we were talking before i hit record about how there really was kind of that dual like here's the carry pre-work here's the carry at work and at that time you don't walk into corporate america saying oh by the way i just finished channeling and and but you might want this message it could be helpful for our <laughs> business right that didn't play so so carry fill in a little bit of the gaps there for us because you've been doing this work a long time when you first started channeling, what was your reaction to that? Well, yeah, th it's interesting. It's interesting uh, to talk about that because what happened to me was that I, up until the age of 50, I was completely non-religious, non-spiritual, not interested in any of that. And uh, and on my 50th birthday, two girlfriends gave me spiritually oriented books. And one of them was The Artist's Way, uh, which, as you may know, has uh, one of the things that you learn to do in there is to do stream of consciousness writing. You do your daily pages. And so I thought that was fun. And I was doing, going down to the garden with my journal and doing daily pages every day but not with a spiritual orientation, really. Just And then I happened to go to a bookstore 
And I found myself walking down that aisle I never went down, which was spirituality and religion. And this book, I was just so compelled to pull this book off the shelf. And it was called You Are Psychic. And I had never been interested in that at all. But there I was. And I was just compelled to read this book. And I actually sat down on the floor and was reading this book. And then my husband came by and he said, oh, are you ready to go? I said, oh, yeah. And I started to put it back on the shelf because I thought, I don't buy books like this. But then, I, yeah, but I've been sitting here reading it. <laughs> I need to get this book. So I tucked it in under his, under his books because I was so embarrassed. <laughs> and then when I got home, I just read the rest of it. And one of the exercises to develop your psychic or intuitive is what we say now, your intuitive senses, is uh, to ask for a word for the day. And since I was already going to the garden every morning and writing pages with a journal book, it was very easy to add that in. So I followed his directions to breathe down to a quiet place, ask for a word for a day, and write down the very first thing that pops in your mind. And I I found that when I did that, that some at some point during the day, something would happen and that word would be exactly the right word for the circumstance. So I was getting pretty interested in this. And then I started, instead of just getting a word for the day, I was getting advice for the day. I was getting all this guidance. And then one day, so I told some some girlfriends, I did not tell my husband about this. And so I told some girlfriends and and one of them said, Well, you're channeling. I said, Chant, what's chant? What's that? And she said, Well, look it up on the internet. It's a thing now, you know? <laughs> so it's a thing. I, looked, I looked it up on the internet. Sure enough, what I was doing was just what was described. And uh, so I right then and there decided, yeah, I'm going to just get what I get. I'm not going to read about all this and all these belief systems. I'm going to just see what this is about, which is my whole approach to all of this. Let's experiment and see what's true for me, right? So uh, one of my friends uh, really needed some advice. And since I was telling him about this wonderful advice I was getting, which, of course, I was using at work and everything. And so she said, would you ask for me what I should do about this lawsuit? So I said, sure. So the next morning I got down into the garden and did my breathing down and said, is there any advice for Mary? And this entirely different voice came. Now I'm talking about a voice inside my head, a thinking voice, if you will. But I could tell it wasn't my own thinking. It was... Uh, some other voice, but it wasn't what I'd been getting before. It was new. It was much more authoritative and was masculine as opposed to feminine, which I've been getting before. And so I just got all this wonderful advice and I'm just writing, writing, writing all of this stuff to tell Mary. And then at the end of this, I said, who are you? Because <laughs> this was a very distinct personality, you know. And the answer was, I'm Quado. So that began years of me getting messages uh, from Quado. And after a while, I was just getting, is there a message today? Is there a message for me to share today? And I would, as you were saying, at 4 a.m., I'd go down there, I'd get the today's message it was always beautiful, beautiful messages. Just it was, it was my spiritual training, is what it was. And then I'd run up to my computer and type it up and send it out on the internet, and then run and shower and get dressed, and then get on the freeway and drive to work. <laughs> That's quite a vision. <laughs> that was it. Was great, actually. It was great. Yeah. And um, so I did that for a very long time, and Quado got a following and one day uh this is now the next adventure one day a one of the quadro readers said would you do a spiritual healing for me and i was in the middle of writing back an email to say i don't do that when 
uh, a little voice in my head said, oh, yes, we do. And it was someone new. It was running well. Wow. <laughs> what can I say, Sarah? <laughs> this is just the way it has been. I'm very fortunate. It just, these things, this is, one must say, it must be on my path, right? I would say, you know, mm -hmm. and they were smart enough not to negate it. Yeah, it's actually, it's such an exciting experience. Don't you find that when you open to the things that go beyond our, oh, our society and our well-trained minds? Um, it's exciting. It is. It's liberating. Yes, that's right. But Carrie, did you have trouble? It doesn't sound like you did, but I'm wondering if you had trouble like translating or communicating the depth or the power of what you were getting into simple, this kind of stuff we're doing language. The only, it's my particular gift, if you will, to receive words and uh, all I had to do was learn how to get out of the way which is no small thing <laughs> but I had to learn how to get out of the way and I have thought about it a lot and I it feels to me as if I'm receiving a block of energy, a block of energetic information. And for some reason, I'm able to translate that into words and it just flows. But I did have to, in order to do different things with it, I had to learn a few skills. I mean, they're learned skills. First was getting out of the way enough to write. And at first, I would say it was a little bit mixed. My own thinking would want to come in a lot. It took a while to be able to quiet down my own thinking and be able to just receive. And it took a while to get to understand how to like breathe myself into a calm enough place where I could hear more clearly. And then after a time, I didn't want to spend all that time receiving and handwriting going up and typing it all. So I thought, well, I need to learn to type these messages directly. So then I had to learn how to receive and translate. The translation part just happens. I don't know how that happens. To receive that energy or message and put it into words and type at the same time. Luckily, I'm a touch typer, so that's all right. But still, that it's, helps. Different, it's different than the handwriting. It is. And uh, then the next iteration of it was when I started doing uh, spiritual healings, readings, power animal retrievals for people. And I wanted to do it uh, live on a telephone. After a while, at first, I just did people would email me a question and I would I would get the answer and type it out. And then I decided I wanted to do it live. And um, on the so I had to learn how to receive and speak at the same time, which is kind of it's a little different. Right. Well, it but would the seem that it would be different. Me, what? It, well, it would seem that it would be different because. You're receiving, but then you have to like, oh, yeah, a separate piece of you is speaking. Yeah, yeah. And you have to do it, though, all at the same time. So what's odd about it is that we're not used to speaking without having any idea what we're going to say. <laughs> that that's, would be odd. It's that's what's really strange is the whole the whole thing depends upon you not knowing and being just as surprised as your listener with what comes out. And the hardest part, really, a lot of this was just an automatic mechanism that I was just able to do. But the hardest part was overcoming my own doubt and learning to trust. Um, especially having been uh, an atheist all those years. <laughs> and That's not a leap. Pardon me? That is a leap. 
Yeah, and all going from not having any any spiritual beliefs to suddenly receiving these messages, except they were so clearly so much smarter than I was. In other words, I would be in all that confused, jumbly thinking, and and I have these ideas about this and that, and then these these messages would come through that were so clear. And the like one of the things, especially as a as a professional out there in the world, you know, you're used to, I I know what to do and going to do this, going to do that, and take charge of this. And often these messages, if I asked for advice, would be not to do anything, to be calm, to listen, to open yourself up to the situation and allow things to evolve rather than just, you know, pushing to get things done. As the universe moves at its own pace, right? <laughs> so were you you were obviously able to do that, but did that take a while to just do nothing? Yeah. Oh <laughs> well that is a hard thing for me. <laughs> I'm a doer, you know. Well, I'm I'm speaking I mean for me it would be too. It's like I even in that sense of going, okay, the thing to do is nothing. Yeah. Okay. How long do I have to wait? Yeah. Right. How long do I have I to do right. nothing? How long until the time is right? <laughs> it's all timing, isn't it? You know, yeah. and and we then it's interesting too with information that you get that about opportunities that fly in, and you have a you have a feeling, gee, maybe I should take advantage of this. Maybe I should do this. And in the beginning, especially when you're hesitant. And you don't have the trust in your intuition and you allow it, you don't do it. And then later you think, oh, I should do that. And oh, it's gone. That opportunity came and it went. Oftentimes the window's small. That that person that you meet that is an opportunity to do something and you don't, you don't speak up when you might, you know, follow through when you might, you let it go. And what I've found over the years is that that particular opportunity is probably just gone. It came along, you had a little intuitive hit, you didn't follow through, and which we do that all the time, right? That's why we are always saying, oh, I knew I should have done that. And, and even though that opportunity is gone, Another one will be coming along, especially if you're clear with your thinking about the direction you want to go, then it's almost as if the universe is out there looking for you, you know, keeping an eye out, sending things your way. <laughs> you, you get more than one chance. You do, but not the same chance, which is interesting. It, it'll be a different opportunity. And It'll be just as scary as the last one, because that's usually why we don't do it, right? We're scared. And, and that's a stranger over there that I'm getting this little hit I had to walk up to and talk to, but it's a stranger and I'm feeling a little shy, so I don't do it. Well, there you go. <laughs> but another, something else will come along. But if we're not careful, we spend our whole lives letting those all those little opportunities go by. So let's talk a little bit more about how, I'm not sure how is the right word I would use. That's why I'm pausing. Mm -hmm. So how we can learn to trust mm -hmm. our intuition more mm -hmm. fully so yeah. that the gap between getting that you should do this and yeah, actually really, doing it a, is short. Such an important question, Sarah. And I know what I did with, it seems kind of odd, but what I did when I first started channeling is I wouldn't read anybody else's channelings. I wouldn't read anything anybody else said about it because I wanted to get straight scoop. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't coloring my thinking uh, with something someone else had written or had received, right? And uh, the other thing that I did, I had a period of time in which I thought, I just want to find out for sure if I really am getting 
intuitive information or psychic information, whichever you want to say. And so what I did for a while was I did readings for people. So I think I was doing power animals at the time, but it doesn't matter a whole lot. And I asked them just to send me their name in an email, no information at all. And then I would ask, is there a message for, is there a message for Sarah? And then I would, at that time, I and then I'd type it out and email it back to them. And I, I was doing this, I didn't want any information because I wanted to know if I could really, really do that. Can I truly get a message meant for that person? And what I discovered was, yes. <laughs> and people people wrote me, oh, my God, that message was, it just changed, turned my life around. It's exactly what I needed to hear. And sometimes I would get really fun things like uh, this one woman uh, just sent me her name. And I uh, did a, a power animal retrieval for her, and I got a songbird. And the message that came along with the songbird was all about allowing herself to sing. And so she wrote me back that she worked at an opera company, but she had an administrative job there because she hadn't had the courage to go after her own desire to be a singer. So... I, what I did then, as you're is, um, saying, is I set myself up some tests. Look for some evidence to convince and yourself. And I would say for, for um, most people, what really works is, first off, you need to train yourself when the stakes are low. Because when the stakes are high, you're competing with fear, and which is very noisy. And, you know, fear is loud and your intuition is this little whisper. <laughs> so you have to learn to tune into the whisper and do it when the stakes are low. So what uh, I would recommend is someone, first off, you keep a journal. Because the intuitive advice you get does not make sense at the time, often. Okay. And... It may not make sense for days even. Uh, but if you just write down, and you always have to take the first thing that comes into your mind. Because after the first words, like if you ask uh, ask an open-ended question, not yes, no, because yes, no limits you to your own thinking, right? Uh, there are always more possibilities than <laughs> what you think. So you ask something open-ended, how should I approach this situation? How should I approach this day? Is there any advice for me today? Things like that. But I love how should I approach the situation? I just love that one. And something will pop into your mind. If, if you're a person who's not strong in getting words through your intuition, you may get a picture instead. I had one person I worked with. She didn't receive words at all. She just received pictures. Then, of course, you have to interpret the picture, but she usually could. And and sometimes, of course, you just get a knowing. It's like, oh, I just know I should do this. But anyway, you write it down and keep a journal. And and the whole thing, too, is about awareness, right? So you get you ask for your advice in a quiet, non-threatening situation. First thing in the morning is best. You breathe. Get relaxed, ask for advice, write it down. And then you pay attention to what happens during the day. And when you find, oh, that's what that meant, you write it down. And this begins to build up trust. And um, another beautiful thing that you can do that I really love, let's suppose you have, because I started using all this in my corporate life, right? I was working, and not that I told people I was using it, I didn't. You didn't share but it. I was. And so, let's I, if you have a difficult person you're dealing with, you just don't get along with them, or maybe they're just flat out difficult people. You know? You're not connecting with them, but they're an important relationship, like your boss 
And what you can do is in the morning, in your quiet time, you breathe down. And then what I would do is remember that everybody is this person, this personality that you know, but they're also their higher spirit. Everybody. There's another level at which they exist, even if you can't see it. And so you send a rainbow of love across to that person. And if it's too hard for you to do that to that personality is making you crazy, <laughs> then send it across to their higher self. And just send love. That's all. Just send love and hope that you'll get a connection. And over time, if you do that, you will. You can't help it. If you you just spend a couple of minutes sending love to someone, it shifts your relationship. There's some level at which they feel that and some level at which you kind of have to change a little if you're going to be sending love. Yeah, I would think so because there's a level of sincerity yeah. that would be required, right? You can't really fake it. You can You can say... Yeah. I'm, you can start faking a little, but if you do it and you fill your heart with love and you send it across, you're bound to see them as a as a human at some point, aren't you? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah. it takes for me that even when you're describing that, it also removes any prior interactions we've had. It's like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this, this exactly. person's essence, who they are. And the whole purpose here, of course, is to get some kind of a human connection going with this person. And what I've found is if you do this, if you actually focus on as hard as it feels at first and just do it, some kind of a connection forms. And of course, I mean, an energy connection, right, forms. And there's a bridge across that rainbow of love that you're sending begins to form a connection and that connection then leads to an opening up of an intuitive connection between you and after a time if you do this you will begin to sense things about them and you'll begin to sense when is the right time to talk to them when is the right time to not right and I'll tell you, I had I worked for a woman that at the end of every day we would have a brief little meeting, and um, I on this particular day, I had during the day I'd written up this whole list of all these things we needed to go over together, and then I would always just before our meeting, and it's, it's important to do this just before because things change. Just before the meeting, I would ask, how should I approach my meeting with Linda? And this one day that I had this long agenda, the answer came, you, one topic only, she's completely busy, she doesn't have time for all of this, just pick one thing off your list. So at this point, I built up enough trust in my intuition that I listened, right? So I changed my agenda and I got just one item on it and I went up to her office and walked in the door and she said oh Carrie I was just trying to reach you to cancel our meeting I am so busy I don't have time and I said I just have one item she said oh well in that case okay <laughs> so once you build up that trust and then you start to build intuitive links with people it's a beautiful thing and you can use it in highly practical ways. I would think so. And not only just, I mean, I love that example that you just shared, you know, because you actually took care or cared about another person in a way that didn't just put your, I need, need, need this first. I don't mm -hmm. care that you're tired. Um, ah. mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or that like, well, I've only got three or four things. It's not going to take that long when someone clearly said their bandwidth is small and they're not going to listen anyway. You know, Do you know what's so 
interesting about what you're saying, Sarah, is this is one of the big differences between our so-called rational thinking or our ego thinking and what we receive if we tune in. When we tune in, we're listening. <laughs> Think of that. When we tune in, it's about me and the rest of the world. And I get solutions that fit me and other people. I get win-win solutions, right? And when it's my ego, all my ego might care about is me. All right? What works for me? Well, that long list worked for me. That's why I spent so much time putting it together. It was a beautiful list. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and sometimes that kind of exercise, and I, I mean, I, and I have those recently where I go through all this. I'm thinking and I'm doing all this work. And then it is that simple, right? It's like we got one topic. And I looked and I think, well, I guess the purpose in that list was for me to get clear on what's on my mind, not necessarily their mind. Excellent. Yes, that's right. That's right. Get your own thinking clear, which is important. Clear it thinking is. is very important. I, I, I believe that everything I think and say and do, all of it has influences my life. All of it causes connections to be made out into the world. And it's all all really important. But sometimes the thinking part, we do need to be clear. If, if my thinking is really confused and jumbled, then what I'm doing is I'm sending out into the universe this really confused and jumbled message, right? Yeah. That are something nice and clear and consistent. Consistent is good too. <laughs> I have trouble with that sometimes. <laughs> I like consistent. I'm glad you threw that in there because I'm going, yeah. And I will sometimes, I can feel like when my thinking is a little bit ping pong like. Right. And especially if I'm in a meeting, I'll just say, someone else has to, to do this. I'm going to contribute, but I, because I know my energy is not stable enough to hold what we agreed to. Oh. Not that I don't care, but that I just, I've either been too busy and I haven't really come to center. And then in a few minutes, I'm there, you know, right. but I, I've learned it's like, hmm, you're not the best leader of the meeting at this point. <laughs> Pass it well, over. That's good. Awareness is always the first step, right? <laughs> that's what they say. So, yeah. Carrie, I want to talk about your book, if you Thank will. You. Um, so, when you wrote Sojourner and Adequa, 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 I asked you and I still did it. Um, what was the driver of that? Like, what was the inspiration for that yeah. book at this time? Well, as, as you mentioned, my, I was married for 46 years and my husband died very suddenly. And uh, what a journey that is. So I knew at some point that there, that during my, especially the first two years are just so tough. And I was determined, though, that I was going to create a new life with joy and love at its center. And so what I did in those two years was I turned to all of these tools and techniques that I had experimented with for 25 years, and I tried them all. <laughs> I just brought everything back out and, and thought, now what out of all of this that I've read and learned and experimented with, what is it that really, really works, what really resonates? in the job of creating a new life with joy at its center. Because what I did not want to do was just spend the rest of my life wasting it on wishing I could have what I could no longer have, right? And uh, so after I went through this, and actually, and I started writing the book, 
while I was still going through this, and there are sections, there's a, a section in there about grief and what I learned about grief as well. And I thought that I need to share this. I spent 25 years learning all of this, and now I'm saying which things really, really work and which things do I want that I would like anyone, even if they haven't gone through the, an experience like that, we all go through the experience of needing to create a new life at certain points. We just do. And um, it's a big job. <laughs> and uh, it is so possible. And so I decided to write this book to let people know. So I I also had a new understanding about certain things, having gone through this. So the first half of the book is more about the way I have come to understand the universe and the way things work. And then the last half of the book is what I call a toolkit, is actual very specific exercises like sending a rainbow of love, like breathing down and asking for guidance. They, you know, so I just spell these things out very explicitly. And, uh, but that's, that's why I wrote the book. So is it for anybody or did you, as you were writing, did you have a sense that you were writing for certain people and i don't yeah. mean like to the exclusion of others but like that is such an interesting question i spent so much time on that and if you were someone that knew me in the last three years you would have heard me say all these different things oh i'm writing a book for for widows oh no i'm no i'm actually writing a book for no i'm right <laughs> i went around and around and finally i thought what is it that makes someone attracted to my point of view? And that's where I got the uh, subtitle, Mind Expanding Ideas and Practical Tools for the Open-Minded Seeker of a Meaningful Life. I finally decided that's who I wrote this for. Because at first when I thought, well, I'm writing, maybe this is for widows so I can help them. And then I went out and I looked at some of the literature that's out there about grief and everything. And a whole lot of it is very mainstream Christian. And I thought, oh, that's right. If you're a, if you're a, a church going Christian, that's where you're going to go to, to figure out how to handle your grief and create a new life. You aren't going to want, you aren't going to be interested in my point of view. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but if, that's so I decided open-minded seeker of a meaningful life because I wanted, as I said, I wanted my new life to be joyful, but also meaningful. Like to me, I, it, to me, that's just so important. And the open-minded part is, well, with my point of view, you have to be open-minded because I'm, I'm saying you'll be getting messages. <laughs> you might be getting messages and channeling and uh, and relying on your intuition to do things that might run against uh, what your reason is telling you. So you do have to be open-minded. So that's what I decided is finally, actually, that's someone just like you. It sounds like it. Aren't you an open-minded seeker? I am. And you I am are. a seeker of that. I am. So maybe that's what motivated the question to see if it was a fit. But <laughs> I, I want to ask you a slightly different question that mm -hmm. occurred to me when you were sharing that. And that is, how do you define for yourself a meaningful life? Mm. Well, that's a good question. I think that a meaningful life is, is a life where part of that life is in service where my life is not, and it might be, it could be in service to a number of different things. It could be in service to other people. It could be in service to spirit or whatever, whatever that is. <laughs> um, it could be in service to art. But I think, I'm so glad you asked this. I hadn't really defined that before. Um, I think 
that for my life to have meaning, it is not just about me. I think it can't just be about me. And I was about to, when you asked that question, I was about to answer, well, it's other people, but not necessarily. There are people whose lives are deeply meaningful, but they're very alone, then it's art, right? Because oftentimes art requires you to work alone. Um, so, well, alone, alone and with spirit usually, or the muse or whatever, but not other humans. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you. When you said that, I'm thinking, okay, alone in the physical plane, perhaps. Uh, right, right, right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, but certainly not, there's certainly plenty of uh, company with your thoughts and your heart and everything. But yeah, I think it must be that. I think it must be that you, your life is in service to something other than just you and hopefully something greater than just you. And you're choosing to spend, yeah, to spend your life in that way. Yeah. So right. a follow on to that then is how do you define joy? Mm. Oh, that. Well, I think, see, I'm an Eckhart Tolle fan and I loved Power of Now. It was a very meaningful book for me. And one of the main things that I got out of that was that this is it, this moment. And I don't mean this life circumstance. I mean this moment that I'm here talking to Sarah Box. <laughs> and in this moment is the only thing that's real. And the past is gone, as lovely or not as it might have been. The future isn't here. I have this moment. And in this moment is the only time I can be happy. Because even though our culture is so based on I'll be happy when in the future, but it isn't true. I'm happy right now or I'm not. But this is it, this moment. And so understanding that happiness is a choice is, I think, really important. Right now, in this very now moment, even if your husband just died, even if this is it, this is the moment that I live, this is the one that I choose what I'm going to do with it. And I found that um, in all of my years of spiritual explorations that I have deep inside, and I believe we all have, a well of joy. It's just there. Deep inside, there's a well of joy. And if I go but I can only access it in this moment, in this now moment. And if I do, if I remember that there's a well of joy inside me, I can go deep inside and the awareness and the memory, the remembering it's there and I go deep inside and it'll just start bubbling up. And if you let that bubble up inside you, it'll then just fill you and just fill you. And you can, even in the midst of extremely difficult times, you can tap into that well of joy and still find joy. It's the, the joy of life, the joy of being alive. The, you can step outside at any time and get that. Just step outside and look at a tree, look at a bird, look at a leaf. <laughs> And look at a vase of flowers on your table and go in and find joy and let it bubble up and fill your life. And then you realize in that moment, too, well, in that moment, of course, of course, this this is it. This is life. And it's always there. Always. So I just, uh, yes. It is. <laughs> and what's interesting is outside of this moment, if I'm not in this moment, which allows me to access joy and happiness, then that means that I've allowed my mind to take me into the past, which is full of regret and blame and also nice memories, but it's the past. And or I've allowed my mind to take me into the future full of worry 
or actually or fantasy which is is different than true intention and can kind of take you some get you in some difficulties <laughs> but right here in this moment i have the joy of life and all that beauty isn't it wonderful it is wonderful. but it, it's odd that we have to learn we have to train ourselves to do this our society certainly doesn't our society does not train us to go into the moment. Well, I think there's an allure that, like you were saying, there I'll be happy when or if or um, when I finally get recognized or I get this yeah. promotion or someone says they love me, whatever. Right. What? Whatever. But um, it isn't in the moment. And it it is where we have to train ourselves. But oftentimes... And I'll speak personally, like when I feel frustrated, I'm going, oh, man, I wish that would. I'm thinking I just stop and go, Sarah, what do you need right now in this moment? And I think, OK, that's a tough question to answer because I don't need anything. Exactly. And it's like I got I, I'm OK. Exactly. I do exactly the same thing. The question I ask myself is, is if I if I'm focusing, there's a problem is do I have a problem right now? Right now, well, I have a roof over my head, my tummy's full. I, you're right, right this moment, I don't. I just think I have some problems that might materialize, or I had some problems, but no, I don't. I'm, I'm with you in this moment. Everything's fine. Well, and, and I want to distinguish that from just saying I'm not, I'm not blowing things off. I'm just saying I don't need to get my knickers in a twist right now. I will handle it. You know, we handle everything that comes to us, whether yes. we want to or not. At some point, a resolution occurs. We either ignore it and it gets bigger or whatever, but we don't need like, to make it a drama. Right, right. I always found that, uh, well, what, two things. One is we just circled back to that intuitive, that message of maybe just do nothing for a little while. <laughs> I like to ask myself, if you just quiet for five minutes, will it look different? Because I guarantee you, it will. It will. It will. You just get quiet. Oh, well, maybe the world isn't coming to an end right yet. And the other thing is that about drama. I've found that when I get truth, if it if it's something I would consider good news or bad, doesn't matter. It feels very objective. And the uh, drama, and that includes excitement. Like when 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 people say, "Oh, you have to do something that really excites you," I'm saying like, mm, "No, I think you have to do something that feels right." <laughs> and things that feel right are calm common objective and and you can tell when you're in the middle of a deep truth about something if it's even about someone's impending death for example this when this truth that in fact they are about to leave this earthly plane will come as something very calm it's not dramatic it's a, oh, 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 yeah, I see. Hmm. <laughs> so having gone through that recently, and this is interesting that you say that because in my mind, I'm experiencing this like, okay. And then the other part of me is going, you should be upset about this. Everybody else is sad and upset. What is wrong with you? Have you no feelings? And I'm going, I got plenty of feelings, but they're not, I don't need them right at this moment. So it's yeah. a weird contrast. It, it is. It just be me, but it's it it's a it's a weird tension. Uh huh. It's very different. It's very different, and it. Um, but this is one of the ways that I know whether or not to trust an intuitive message, and by message can be a feeling or whatever. Sure. Um, an intuitive message that, especially if it runs counter to what you might otherwise think is if it has that really calm objective feeling and i found that what happens too is that when sometimes when we know we need to do something you know you need to 
quit a job, for instance, and you know it, and your calm, objective heart knows this, but it's scary. And we're, we're presented with this all the time. The path, the path that is there for us to walk is not necessarily easy. <laughs> People make a big mistake if they think, oh, this is too hard. This can't be my path. It's too hard. No. <laughs> yeah, that's the way that is. It's like challenge after challenge after challenge. That's our life path. And that's how we're growing and expanding and lifting ourselves to the next level. And then we think, oh, I made it. I made it. I'm here. No, you're just at a level now when you get to make a bigger challenge. <laughs> it's kind of like the cosmic joke. <laughs> I think, okay, this feels great. I'll just take a breather for a minute because something else will be coming along. It actually feels good when you move through a challenge that felt heavy. Yeah or uncertain, and then someone around you has to go through the same challenge, and you know they'll be okay. It's not going to feel yeah. good. It's just yeah, not going to right. be great. That's right. And then there you are feeling really good about everything, and then the you climb to the top of that mountain, and then the fog clears, and you see there's another higher peak over there. <laughs> It oh, is good. No. It's good to be able to laugh at that stuff. <laughs> it is. It's like, okay, that was nice. You got to cruise for about 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I'm, you. I'm being sarcastic, but it, I know, I know. And then you go. I know. <laughs> right. And then the the thing that's beautiful though is that you find that you're you're kind of like a new person when you go through those. You overcame some of these, oh, it's such a relief to overcome some of those things that you had since you were a child. Oh, my goodness. Finally, and you say, oh, all right. Ah, and you become ever more yourself, right? And every challenge that you overcome, you say, oh, no, okay. Okay, I see. I'm beginning to see uh even more strength in myself i'm beginning to see even more depth that i can go into um mm -hmm. i wonder carrie if what we're seeing isn't more of who we truly are i think it is i think that's right it's somehow the mechanism seems to be that when we face the challenge and do it of course, if you deny it and step back from it, well, then you don't change, right? But if you accept the challenge and go into it and do it and go through what you need to go through, I agree. You're just becoming more yourself in that process. Mm -hmm. yep. An awareness of yourself you didn't even have. Which is quite a gift. Oh, yes. It's beautiful. Carrie, what are you looking forward to in 2023? Oh. I know that you're in this moment, but I'm asking you to project. <laughs> well, <laughs> I believe in, no, that's right. Because I believe in live in this moment, but have an eye to the future, yeah. right? Have an eye toward where you want to go because the universe is paying attention. And I need to send out some clear signals. Hey, bring me this kind of opportunity. Well, I am going to uh, start up a, a new venture that is not yet quite defined with an old friend of mine, a friend that I met uh, singing. We're both singers. And I'm, we're not, I have ideas about what it's going to be, but it's not finalized yet. We're, we're going to be starting some brainstorming sessions soon. And so I have, I have two different things I'm pursuing. One is this venture with my friend that I'm pretty sure we'll be doing like some joint podcasting things and we're going to have a website that has offerings from both of us and she's more on the environmental health side and we know I'm on the spiritual side of things and I want it to be an exciting place where you could go every day and and have fun while also engaging and living a meaningful life <laughs> and part of that too 
is I know in the book, I talked about Wanatakwe, was this energy that came to me. And the word Atakwe is is part of a vocabulary that I got from the Wanatakwe energy. And so I'm starting to go more and more deeply into that. And uh, so it's a discovery process. It's like I had my Quado period, and I had my Running Wolf and Power Animal period. And so I'm the the latest gift uh, that I'm being drawn into is Wanachakwe, which is energy that was very active uh, thousands of years ago in the Amazon area and uh, has chosen me as a vehicle to come back into the world uh, as it is today to try to see about bringing us the gifts of humankind meeting its potential of dignity and truth and love and goodness. So how the, exactly how those are going to mesh, I don't know yet. It's powerful work. But if I may, what I would really love is if your listeners would go to my website and sign up for my newsletter, then I would be able to tell them when I have something new. Well, then we'll make sure the link is there. Okay. Um, and I would encourage folks, and seriously, I do this at every podcast because I know there are people listening to you who have been waiting to hear your voice and they oh. just know it, right? Like they had that, whoa, Carrie's who I've been kind of waiting to hear from. And, you know, because we resonate with people differently. Right. And I, you know, how like sometimes you hear a message and it doesn't click and then you hear that message similar from someone else and you're going, that's it. Yes. Yes. That's it. So uh -huh. I know there's more than one person hearing that today because I'm one of them. So I believe in math, but <laughs> I know there's more. So I, I do encourage everybody to go get on your newsletter and that it's a really great way to stay connected with you mm -hmm. and with what emerges from your work. I'm so intrigued on both of these directions and, and ultimately like the next piece of you that you share with the yes. world. Yes, I'm excited about it. Very excited. So I'm going to let you have final word here on the podcast before I do my formal sign off. And, um, you know, is there a question you wished I would have asked you that we need to cover? No, I don't think so. I think that I think we did that. I mean, on the one hand, I feel like we could talk for another two or three hours. <laughs> So that makes it difficult. Well, to then I am going to go get a cocktail and come back. You know, if we're gonna do that. it's five o'clock. We can, you know, somewhere. <laughs> no, I do. I feel like the, this has been great. I was just sitting down with a girlfriend, having a good talk. And uh, no, I thought your your questions were wonderful. They were just right on the right on the button. And uh, I look and I'm hoping, too, that when I do come up with my next new venture, I will let you know I'd love to come back. I would love to have you back. I, that is a sincere offer. Good. Really sincere. Because um, I want to know what's happening. <laughs> I well, do. What, what, I, what I'm finding with the book and with these being on the podcast is uh, the real gift of it is meeting people like you, meeting some people I hadn't met before that I feel uh, I'm on the same plane with, that some connections that are going to go forward. And I'm very excited about that. The, as one of the things I talk about in my book uh, is the, the web of the universe and how it just connects and connects and connects. And I'm feeling like right now, not only do I get to connect with you, but I get I have now an energetic connection with all the people that are connected to you in this way. So it's very exciting. Very exciting. I like to think of it as kind of like this global tapestry and you pull on one thread, but it still has a ripple out to other threads and um, that's and right that you might not ever know, but it's there. That's right. That's right. And you know, the nice thing about tapestries too, is that you can be in there really close and you do that. And then you step back and you see this whole work of art, which our lives are. And um, maybe someday we'll understand them. 
I would love to. I'd like to understand, but I'm coming to the place where I go, you may not get to understand everything. You just got to be there. Yeah, that's right. Stand up, show up. That's right. Two pieces of great advice I was given many years ago. Just show up. Yes, yes. And do that thing. I I have a thing that I call scary good. And that, that I know that's where I know I should do something, but it's really scary. And but it's a good thing. I I can feel it's a good thing for me to do, but it's really scary. And those are the times when the doors really open. When you say, oh, well, I'll get out there and see if anyone wants to interview me on this book. You know, and and of course, these every everything you do that's new is scary at first. Right. It is. But that's that's where we just open up the doors and start to fly. <laughs> and Yeah. Go forward with it all. Carrie, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. And I do want you to come back. So you don't have to wait forever. Just reach out. Okay, Sarah. Let me know. You know the door's open. And um, thank you again. And listeners, check out the links. You know, we always have them in the show notes for you. Check them out. Get on Carrie's website. Get on her newsletter list. And then she'll keep you in the know. All right. Excellent. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash No Labels, No Limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review, and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.